Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shiruri anfusina wa min sayyati amalina min yahdiya lahu fala mudlala wa min yulil fala hadiya lahu wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. My brothers and sisters in Islam, first and foremost, I want to thank the brothers that invited me here. Because when we don't thank the people, we don't thank Allah. And inshallah ta'ala, I want to thank all the brothers and sisters who made it today. You know, by the call of Allah, we are here together as brothers and sisters in Islam. And inshallah ta'ala, when we walk out of here, hopefully we could be a benefit to each other. The reason why specifically I chose the topic, the wake up call, is because many of you can identify with transcend in my life, being born and raised a Christian, born and raised in a Christian household, and living out my life thinking that, you know, very, very minimal about the hereafter. The lifestyle that I used to live, being born and raised in New York City, I was surrounded by drugs, I was surrounded by violence, I was surrounded by crime. This was a lifestyle that I endured by default. It wasn't my choice. By default. And today, some of the brothers and sisters today try to incorporate this lifestyle into an understanding that is so pure. And that purity and simplicity is Islam. And like I said, I spent a huge percentage of my life in darkness, doing for many years what I thought was right. But to become a Muslim and find out that I was spending 24 hours of my day consistently, every day, involving myself and indulging in all the major sins that are prohibited for the movement. 24 hours a day. And living in this lifestyle, you know, and living in New York City, I was always familiar with the Muslim, you know. Alhamdulillah, I come from a community, I come from a city that is very diverse. Like if you never had a passport and you lived in New York, I'm pretty sure you would meet every ethnicity around the world without ever having to leave the country. So I was very familiar with the diversity of the human being. And living in my community, I looked at all the Muslims as my brothers in the struggle. Because living in the inner city environment, we all endured a very common you know, understanding, and that was surviving. So the Yemenis brothers who own most of the local grocery stores, I was very familiar with them. Alhamdulillah, the Pakistani brothers, they own most of the pharmacies. You know, the West African brothers, mashallah, to Brother Kala, they had all the taxi and livery services. <laughs> so this is the way we perceive it. Alhamdulillah, you had the Asian brothers, they had the Chinese restaurants and the laundromats. So this was my Jahil way of thinking, that everyone played a, just a significant role in the community. It didn't matter where they came from, what was their ethnicity, what was their background, what was their culture. I know in Harlem, we all had a significant role to play in our communities. And being that I was always exposed to the Muslim, it made a lot of guidance in these brothers because they never exposed none of us to Islam. We spent most of our hours standing on the very corners in front of some of these grocery stores where the Muslim exists. We spent a lot of our time riding in the taxis that were driven by Muslims. We spent a lot of time getting sick and going to the pharmacy asking for medicine and never was called to Islam. And it took for me to leave America by way of the success that came from the music business and traveling the world to see the diversity of people and to see for the first time in my life the many places that the Muslim realm, subhanAllah, you can walk down one street in America and see 17 churches within a mile's radius. When I left America, I seen the same number of masjids or masajids. 
I've seen things I've never seen before. I've seen buses pull over on highways in some countries and everyone get off the bus to make a lot. I've seen people prostrate to Los Apenawata Island in places that I probably would have never even put my hands, let alone my head. And for the first time when I heard the event, it made me melt. Because I never heard anything that demanded a person's attention like the event. And wallahi, I spent hours and hours in the studio trying to conjure up methods to make people dance and make fools of themselves. But when I heard the event and the power and the, and the attention that it demanded, I've never heard anything like it in my life. And basically traveling in the world with no dawah, no one spoke to me about Islam, no one called me to Islam, no one introduced me to Islam. I was around Muslims, but I never was able to see that sound right there. SubhanAllah. <laughs> I'm not even mad at you for your phone going on. MashaAllah. <laughs> yeah. SubhanAllah. And every time I reflect on these things, it just reminds me. You know, it wakes me up as a reminder to myself. When I think about the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I think about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the gratitude that increases every day, every day I prostrate before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm constantly reminded of what I was saved from. Constantly reminded of what could have actually happened to me if I would have died in that state. Believe me, I thought that death would be easy if I was high. If I was intoxicated, death would be easy. I used to get intoxicated before I got on every plane, thinking if the plane go down, I'll, I'll be straight, you know. I probably won't even feel it. Stuff of Allah, I mean. In this Jahil way of thinking, I was saved. I was spared only by Allah's mercy. And sometimes I look at other individuals in my family who may not have accepted Islam yet. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah guide in Islam. But I look at certain individuals in my family that I always identify with to be good people. And I used to question, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't choose them? Like, why didn't he choose me? Why was I so fortunate? I wasn't looking for the Muslim. I wasn't looking for Islam. I didn't have too many Muslim friends. And if I did, they never acknowledged they were Muslim. And now that I became a Muslim, I understand why. And that's why I chose, chose this topic as the wake up call. Because what's happening now that I've been able to benefit and learn the basic fundamentals of my religion and the pride that comes with being a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I look at my brothers and sisters in Islam today, and I question why. Better yet, how? How could you compromise your Islam? How could you compromise your Islam? Is it to make those who may not understand Islam feel comfortable? Is it because you know you struggle with your Iman? because of living in Western civilization? These questions go through my mind every day. And I know myself, I'm proud to be a Muslim, subhanAllah. I go to the airport, I wear a kameez, I wear, I wear a jalabiyah, and I'm proud, you know? I might just get to the airport a little bit earlier. You know, I know the routine. <laughs> You know, but I'm not ready to compromise myself. I'm a Muslim. I'm the I'm a Muslim. And the good mannerisms and characteristics of the Muslim is what intrigued me about Islam. I was able to see a different aspect of the Muslim. I was able to see different behavior patterns and, and customs of the Muslim that drew me closer to Islam. Unlike the examples I grew up around, Allahu Mustan, may Allah guide these brothers. But the reality of it is, that was the dawah. That was the dawah. So while many young brothers and sisters was watching me on TV, parading around, glorifying this lifestyle, 
I was watching you. While you was watching me, believe it or not, I was watching you. And what I saw only by the Father of Allah, only by the decree of Allah, what I saw was good. It's almost like Allah put a veil over all the shortcomings and deficiencies of the Muslim and just showed me the good. And once I was able to develop an understanding of the religion, Allah removed that veil. And what I see now is that we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We need to embrace our religion. We need to embrace the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose us only by his mercy and gave us an opportunity to worship him and him alone and not associate any partners with him. Only for the hope that one day, when that day comes, we may enter his jinnah and endure pleasure upon pleasure. I like to say the party that don't stop. You know, I've been to a lot of parties, trust me. It was times me and Puff, we would get off a plane, I mean, twice in one day, in two different countries, partying. But I will always wake up the next day with a hangover and regret. But knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his promise is true. His promise is true. Who are we to doubt? Allah's promise. That if we worship him and him alone, that we fulfill our obligations and the rights that Allah have over us, that we will enter his jinnah. Just like Allah's promise was true when he said, you know, when you sacrifice for the sake of Allah, Allah will return it with better. I believe that. And wallahi, I walked away from everything. And it was the fairest trade. Because everything in life, everything in this dunya has an expiration date. Everything. You could take a bite out of apple right now, sit it on the table, go make wudu and come back, that apple will be brown. It won't be crunchy white anymore. Everything has an expiration date. So the reality of it is, we're trying to get to a place where nothing expires. Now how do we get there? How are we preparing ourselves to get there? Because compromising our religion is not going to get us there. Removing ourselves from the, the circles of individuals who fear Allah is not going to get us there. This brotherhood that Allah has established, he's made y'all my brothers and sisters in Islam. I said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Just like that, I have 1.5 billion brothers and sisters. And every time I give a talk, people ask me about the friends I left behind. SubhanAllah, I can count my friends, but I can't count as many brothers and sisters in Islam I have. If you ask me as a fair trade, what's a couple of friends? 1.5 billion brothers and sisters. SubhanAllah. We have to start doing the math. I think sometimes we're negligent to that. Especially with y'all being students. Math should be nothing to you. Do the math. This Ummah is big. This Ummah is growing. We have no marketing, no promotional vehicle. People come to Islam only by Allah's guidance. And alhamdulillah, most of y'all, by show of hands, how many here are born and raised Muslim? Don't be shy. Born and raised Muslim. I ain't saying born under the natural inclination of monotheism. I'm talking about born and raised Muslim. Alhamdulillah, one more time, by show of hands. There we go. Now you look like a roller coaster ride. That's what's up. Now, how many brothers and sisters here, such as myself, are reverse? Reverted to the um, religion of Islam. Now, how many of here are my brothers and sisters from Adam? Meaning my non-Muslim brothers and sisters. Y'all are my brothers and sisters from Adam. Inshallah, one day you'll be my brother and my sisters from Islam. But the reality of it is, is that Islam is a protection. Islam is a protection. And I spent many years of my life running around naked when I thought I had protection. Whether it was a bodyguard, a gun, a knife, whatever I thought I had was going to protect me, I was actually naked the whole time. 
But for the mu'min, some of you who just raised your hands, born and raised Muslims, only by Allah's mercy, you came from the womb of a Muslim. So you've been protected before you even knew how to speak. Allah placed you in a safe place before you knew anything. You came from the womb of a Muslim. SubhanAllah. Your parents probably came from the womb of a Muslim. And so on and so on. But when you think about the brothers and sisters like myself, who was in darkness, completely lost, no idea, no clue of Islam, and Allah guides us into the fold of Islam, and the appreciation that we, 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 we establish, the appreciation that we endure for being saved from that darkness. And I look at my brothers and sisters in Islam who were born and raised Muslims, and I say to myself sometimes, how? How could you compromise the safety that's been bestowed upon you since birth to put yourself in a position where we just left? Put yourself in a position that I just left. Every night I did a show, I put myself in danger. Y'all read some of these things. Fights break out in the club, someone gets stabbed. 16-year-old girl don't even belong there, fake ID. Someone slips her a date rape drug and she gets molested or raped. This was something that I was exposed to after every show. And you know what? I never wanted to be responsible for it because I felt like my songs was commercial. I wasn't out there talking, you know, about killing everybody on the song. I never made derogatory songs or derogatory statements towards women. I thought that I took the most commercial approach to dealing with the music business, but it never allowed me to escape from the ills that came with the game. You can't have one without the other. You can sit there and, and smooth it out as much as you want. But I still had to watch people get dragged out of clubs for being stabbed. I still watched people in parking lots get shot. I still watched young girls making up their face to be older than they are and finding themselves in situations where they may have never, ever encountered any type of physical relationship with no man. And the first time it happened, next time they find out they're HIV positive. This is what Islam has protected you from. This is what Islam has protected you from. So who are you to remove this shield from yourself? To place yourself in harm's way. To dive in the arms of the shaitan. SubhanAllah. And the understanding simplicity that comes with this blessing is another thing that intrigued me because I lived a very spontaneous life. I didn't know if I was going, I was coming. The phone call decided my day. The phone call decided what I was going to do for the day. Sometimes I would go to Chinese restaurants and stuff and open up a fortune cookie and really blindly base my faith on whatever was in that fortune cookie. Fortune cookie would say, you know, you're going to have a great day. And I used to have a great day, like SubhanAllah. Cookie was right. <laughs> now every week I'm eating Chinese food. You know, if you sit down, you're like, you want something to drink? Nah, just bring the cookies out. I need to find out what's going on in my life first. I don't want to drink nothing. Superstitious too. If I drink something, it might mess up my fortune. Let me just get the cookie first. Sometimes I couldn't perform unless I had, you know, like my favorite chain or my favorite watch. Panicking in the dressing room. Where's my watch? So you gotta get on stage. I ain't getting on nowhere without my watch. All of this shut up. I had no idea. I grew up in a house where we would fight for the Sunday paper. My grandfather, he wanted the news section. I wanted the horoscope. I needed to see my horoscope set. Not even knowing that this same newspaper is printed all over New York City. So whoever else is born on my day got the same horoscope as me. So it wasn't nothing exclusive. It wasn't nothing significant to what was going on in my life. But that just shows you how a part of me was searching for something. I didn't know what it was, though. But I was searching for something. And Allah guided me to Islam. 
But dig this, you was born this way. You was born in a household. Well, you probably was playing at seven years old. You know, I'd be smacking the back of the head, come on, pull up. But after a while, you start doing it on your own, right? That was like training wheels to me. I, I knew about training wheels. You take the training wheels off, you ride the bike by yourself. You know? You learn how to write, recite Quran. You pray like your dad. You recite like your dad. You know, looking around the room, some of y'all might even look like your dad. And this is the beautiful thing. Being born upon the truth. Now me, you know, growing up, you know, as a Christian, I had certain suspicions when I was young. Because I used to spend six days a week in the church. My grandmother, she sung for the United Negro College Fund Choir. She used to have these real late rehearsals. I'd be sitting there, sliding down the church, and it's just tired, and I'd sit here and watch these people sing all day. You know? And I remember I used to go to Bible studies. And I remember just repetitively keep hearing about Jesus praying. So I remember asking my pastor, I said, you know, um, pastor, I need to ask you a question. He's like, yeah, what's the problem, son? I said, well, you know, um, if, if, if Jesus is God and he's praying, who he's praying to? And he just shut me down. Boy, you don't believe in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? I said, oh, oh, calm down. Like, he's about to just <laughs> beat me down. I'm a little kid. I'm only like eight, nine years old. But it was a legitimate question. And you got me in Bible study, so eventually I'm going to come across this. Anybody that's there for the right reasons, you know, not just there because grandma's singing or just cause there because I have to be there. I was learning things myself. And I started to see certain things that just didn't make sense. And he just kind of shut me down. And from that point, well, I never went to church again. I said to myself, I'm just going to believe in God because whoever Jesus is praying to, that's the man. That's the man because I tried to pray to Jesus and I can't say the response time was always on time. But I know when I used to scream, oh my God, you know, it seemed like something was working. And I knew there was only one creator. And this line made all of this clear to me. But once again, you already knew this. You already knew this. I mean, when I was 10 years old, if I'd have had a nightmare, I'd have ran around the house in my underwear, screaming, top of my lungs, wake everybody up. You 10 years old, what you do? I would be like, man, you shit dog, You knew how to protect yourself. A nightmare was a nightmare for everybody in my house. Y'all all gonna feel this, you know? But you knew how to protect yourself. You didn't have to wake the house up. You just ask the Lord, you seek refuge in the law from the accursed shaitan. I hold the belay in the shaitan. <laughs> wow. Can you understand? I'm looking like, how could you neglect that? How? That's a protection. Everything is a wisdom behind Islam. Marriage is a protection, it protects you from fornication. Yeah, I'm being like, I understand sometimes young brothers, I've seen the faces, like, oh boy, when I don't have $50,000, man, I've been trying to get married. Dad wants me to buy his daughter a plane. <laughs> I can't afford no plane, man. I understand. <laughs> Stop for a hobby. <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's a protection. It's a protection. Sisters as well. When the law commanded you, to guard your modesty. This is a protection. You don't have to worry about a guy intoxicated running up, hugging you, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guarantee you, we're next to nothing. The man can't control himself. It ain't his fault. He's looking like, you know, it starts from a genuine hug, then a squeeze, and he might try to swing his hands past real quick or something crazy. <laughs> Stuff from law. This is a protection. It's wisdom behind this religion. And we don't need to be trying to, you know, figure it out no other way. Allah gave you the test and the answers. You have the Quran, you have the Sunnah. That's it. If Islam was an airline, 
All you need what? Two carry-on bags. Quran Sunnah. I've been in that airport and I've seen some very miskeen families, subhanAllah. 18 boxes, the house lamp, they got a bird cage, and all. where are you going with all this stuff? And you wonder why you're sitting in the airport for three days. But this flight is going to Jannah. Only thing required, two carry-on bags. That's it. The bird cage and the mother boxes is waiting for you in your destination. Bigger boxes. Bigger cats. You can walk around with lions. You don't need kittens. This is gender. And then like this has to soften your heart every day to know that first and foremost Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his promise is true. His promise is true. You may have good intentions, Mark. No, I can't. You may have great intentions. But you're deficient. I say meet me at six, you get there at seven. Was I wrong for believing in you? No, your intentions were sincere. But were there any guarantee? That. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say be somewhere at six, I know Allah is already there. His promise is true. And this is where we have to wake up. We have to look at ourselves. Because your companions are a reflection of your religion. Your companions, the company you keep, is a reflection of your religion. And we mustn't compromise what distinguishes us from other people. Like I said earlier, I'm proud to be a Muslim. I come to the airport, I know. They say be there an hour, Muslims be there an hour and a half. It's all good. Not a problem. Cold red, cold orange, cold gray, don't matter. I just get there early. I don't have much to search. Got on the uh, Khamis, okay? Ain't much to search. Don't have a belt. I don't need to put that in the tray. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to tie my beard in a ponytail and tie it to my neck or something, throw on some skinny jeans just to make it through the metal detector. But once again, I'm paying for the flight, right? So if I'm going to pay $1,000 to fly, I'm going to fly the way I want to fly. You understand? I have that right. You have that right. And I say this not to say that you have to, you know, implement these things. You do it to the best of your ability. Do it to the best of your ability, but what's wrong with being able to distinguish from my brother in Islam? I'll give you a scenario. If I was on the highway, doing 70 miles per hour, which I call it kilometers, 120 would be like right for American speed, right? Well, you know, 60, 70 miles per hour, I see a brother, it's fine law, on the side of the highway, having car trouble. But he got on an Adidas suit. No beard, nothing. I just can't see at 60 miles per hour what's in his heart, right? I can't. I'm not judging him. I'm not critiquing him. But at 60 miles per hour, Allah, I, keep, I cannot see what's in that man's heart. So naturally and instinctively, I'll probably just keep driving. But if I saw a brother that was on the side of the road and I'm doing 60 miles per hour and there's some type of clear indication that he is a believer, it would be instinctive for me as a believer to pull over and stop and aid my brother in Islam. Not saying that I would never aid a non-Muslim. Don't get me wrong. This is just to clarify the distinction between knowing a, you know, a Muslim when you see a Muslim. But it would be instinctive for me to pull over and aid a brother in Islam. My, subhanAllah, his brother looks like he got car trouble. We pull over and help him. Same thing with sisters. You already know. I mean, Muslim brothers, we're shy. So we see a woman on the side of the road. She doesn't have, she's not guarding her chastity right now. Cars are going by, hair is flying all in the air. This is not, I can't know if I can do this. But if I see my sister in Islam over there, hijab, or khimar, or something that indicates that this is a sister in Islam, she's in trouble, it's instinctive for me to pull over and aid her. Same thing with one of you brothers. I'm walking down the street. You getting beat up. All I see are your shoes in the air. You screaming, get off me, get off me. Then I see you at Jumar. Look like a raccoon, both your eyes black. 
saying, subhanAllah, what happened to you? Yeah, that was on such and such a street. That was you? Yo, I came, I ain't saying Allahu Akbar or something. I, I'd have came. <laughs> you know, I would have came and helped you. I, you know, I'm in shape. I'd have got beat up with you. You know? We'd have both been in Juma looking like raccoons. You know? These are just analogies to just, to, you know, to remind you that, Aki, this is important. This is important, you know what I'm saying? Look at the, mir the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You could look in the sky and see a star, right? Billion light years away. Clear. But you can't see a hundred feet in front of you. That's a miracle. In the same way I should be able to identify with a star, I should be able to identify with a Muslim. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? So when I say, you know, we need to wake up, there's just so many aspects. I could be here all day talking about how many ways we need to make up, wake up. But the reality of it is, this is the icebreaker. This is the first talk. I don't want to come through just like sounding like I'm passing judgment or anything on my brothers and sisters in Islam. But I love all of y'all for the sake of Allah. And it's just a reminder for myself first and foremost and a reminder to you just to know that, listen, I've done that stuff for you. Trust me. I've epitomized all of those sins, whether you want to believe it or not. You know, my oldest daughter is on her second year of college. I've been a father since I was 16. I left my house at 15. Last grade I completed was the eighth. You understand? I have a criminal history that I don't only get reminded of when I'm coming through customs. I'm so a mirror now, I forgot about them. It takes me coming through some type of like border patrol or something for them to be like, hey, what happened in 2004? What happened in 1990? What happened? I'm like, wow, I forgot about that guy. I just been on the mirror right now. I didn't even know that, that guy still exists. But the thing is, I've been a product of that environment. I've been a product of that environment. I spent 24 hours a day in my life for years living that way. And I wasn't at peace. I wasn't at peace. Doesn't matter how many hundreds of thousands of dollars I spent on cars and jewelry and things of this nature, it never made me happy inside. I used to have to live vicariously through people who didn't have. You understand? To me, it was a chain. It took somebody to say, oh, what kind of diamonds is those? Now I feel like, oh, yeah, or these right here is canary, these ones right here. Now I feel like I have something on my neck. And, I, and wallahi, many rich people are like this. Many of them. Worth $50 million, $100 million. You go to their house, they got a boat sitting there with seaweed, all kinds of stuff on the side of it. Boat ain't moved in three years. But soon as one of us come in, a layman, they ain't getting no money. We see it and they be like, oh, you got a boat. You never seen a boat? Oh, Sapan, I'm like, yo, listen, you gotta get your friends. We're gonna go out there. We're gonna take the boat out. We're gonna go fishing. We're gonna go skinny. Now he wants to live all over again. But the boat was just sitting there for three years. He's unhappy. The boat sitting there looked just as unhappy as him. Pool looking unhappy, leaves all, he's just unhappy. This is a gloomy place until someone comes in and then he wants to extract the benefit from it. Now he wants to call the pool cleaner. Now he wants to get someone to scrub the boat. Now he wants to invite all your friends and all y'all can dive off the side of the boat. I don't care if you ever come back up for air or whatever. I just want to live vicariously through you. This is what rich people do. This is their lives. But when you see the glorification of it on TV, you say to yourself, I want a piece of that. I need that. I gotta try that. That car looks fast. There's too many stop signs in Brisbane. You ain't gonna be able to really open up no Ferrari. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 You're lucky you get the second gear, subhanAllah. <laughs> but you want these things. But like I said, everything has an expiration date. Some of y'all have been on roller coasters. You know how it is. First time, you're holding on tight, gritting your teeth on. Second time, you might loosen up a little bit. Third time, you throw your hands in the air. Fourth, fifth time, you're on the phone. Like, yeah, I'm on a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
391 now. Hold on, here come the loop. Yeah, you know. I'll probably ride this joint one more time and I'm out of here. Oh, there it is. There's nothing. There's nothing. But the first time, what? You stood on the line for two hours in the grueling heat, waiting to get on the roller coaster. Straight up, you haven't even ate. Your stomach growling. Probably didn't miss this a lot. Waiting to get on the roller coaster. But after a while, you realize it wasn't worth missing a lot. It wasn't worth putting off a meal. It wasn't worth those things. You understand what I'm getting? And that's how it affected me. That's how it started to affect me. I started to realize, listen, this is just a car. Probably the guy in the Fiat, he's going to get to his destination before me. You know? The chain, people are only talking to the chain. They don't even talk to me. I had people used to run up on me like, yo, I heard. They just grab your arm like, yo, I heard you. Like, you didn't even ask me how I'm doing. You know, I was sick last week. You know that, right? It's not a concern of yours. You're more interested in how I'm upgrading in this so-called value of, you know. But you don't even care about me. And that's when I started to have my detachment with people. And that's why I told you it was a fair trade to let that go to have brothers, to have sisters. It's better for me. My brothers and sisters in Islam, they want good for me. I want good for them. You understand? I see my brother in Islam doing something wrong. I'm going to advise him. I'm going to pull him to the side. I'm going to advise him. I'm not going to make a spectacle out of him. I'm going to pull him to the side. And I'm going to advise him. Like, Aki, you could be nullifying your good deeds. What you're doing right now, you're destroying your good deeds. Like, you don't want to do that. We don't want to stand before Allah to Allah. All of our good deeds being destroyed, even though our intentions are sincere. Nah, we don't want to do that. Nah, you're right, brother. Man. Come to And I will hope my brother do the same for me. Aid me. You know, it's a statement by Abu Bakr. Radiallahu an, the best of creation after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I am no better than any of you. If I was to do that which is correct, then aid me. And if I was to do that which is an error, rectify me. This is the humbleness. This is the humbleness of the Sahaba. And that's why it's incumbent upon all of us to follow their way. Follow the Prophet Sallallahu Follow the Sahaba. These are men of virtue. These are my heroes. These are the people that I look up to. I could care less about what Jay-Z doing. People keep asking me, is Jay-Z and I'm like, Masonic, is they like, you know, or they like, you know, Masons? Who cares? When Allah promised you victory, why are you worrying about what they putting together? Put yourself together. Get prepared what Allah got for you, inshallah. I'm not into all the propaganda. I'm not into that stuff. I don't watch the media. I don't watch the news. I don't listen to the radio. I abstain from these things. And I try every day to detach myself from the dunya. And you know what Sahaba I'm following? Musa ibn Umayyah. For those of you who are not familiar with him, he was the pride of Mecca. They used to call him the flower of Mecca. For lack of better words, some of y'all from the street, he was the flyest kid in Mecca. Flyest kid in Mecca, subhanAllah, he had it all. And he gave everything up, even his life, for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. And when it came time to bury this brother, all they found was a cloth. And when they tried to wrap him from his head to his feet, his feet would stick out. And they tried to wrap him from his feet to his head, his head would stick out. So when people try to praise me about what I sacrifice for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, this is what keeps me grounded. First thing click in my mind, was sovereign and man. You know what? I ain't give up nothing. I ain't did nothing. So find your Sahaba rookie card. Who's your Sahaba? Keep your Sahaba rookie card on you. Because these were the best of the people. These were the people that abstained from the life of the dunya for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sacrificed. And that's what we need to do. And in order to truly wake up, and like they say, smell the coffee, we need to sacrifice. We need to be more grateful. 
Gratitude goes a long way. We show our appreciation for things that have no value. We show our appreciation for things that mean nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We spend our time, which we will be questioned about on Yom Al-Qiyamah, not in the memories of Allah. I know many of you, you don't have to expose your sins. Spend hours on Facebook, hours in front of the computer. Probably in three years, you'll be wearing glasses the size of whiskey bottles, just thick glasses, just sitting there, you know, damage your eyes. But when it comes time to Salat, you'll wait till almost the next Salat is in. Then you go posturing and pecking like a chicken real quick. I gotta hurry up and get up on the end and try to have some wings. And subhanAllah, that might be your last salat. You know? So I realize, you know, I want to be able to benefit from y'all. Because today, to me, this was just a way of breaking the ice. Hopefully, inshallah to Allah, you same brothers and sisters will attend the other talks that I will be having while I'm staying here, inshallah. But this is an opportunity for us to unite as brothers and sisters in Islam and aid one another in waking up and holding on tight to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Jazakallah khayr and salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, while we're waiting for Brother Ismail to bring up something, um, mashallah, one of the things that I benefited more than, I mean, other things in this talk was about having your sahabi, your companion of the Prophet Sallallahu who is your inspiration. As uh, the brother mentioned, as Lun mentioned, uh, Brother Amir mentioned in his, there was a sahabi in Medina called Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu, and subhanAllah, what an inspiration he would have been, because as you know, Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu, he was very wealthy, he had a lot of the pleasures of the dunya, and then came the wake-up call and then he became a Muslim, although he may have left the dunya and many things of the dunya, but he had so much happiness that he found in Islam. And we hope, inshallah, and pray, that is what Allah is giving to Brother Amir in this life and eternally in the hereafter as well. Uh, now, inshallah, we'll have the question and answer time. Um, as we just heard before, um, before we, for question and answers, uh, it would be good, um, Brother Amir would prefer if you could write the questions down. Um, especially the sisters, if you could write the questions down and, and pass the them over. Ask, the brothers can ask, it's just, I would rather the sisters. Okay. Um, so if the sisters could write the questions and pass them down, and the brothers, you Inshallah. could uh, put your hand up, or if you didn't want to, you could write whatever you like. These are some of the other talks that are coming up. Um, this, is the, this is the talk that's there today, as you can see, the wake-up call, tomorrow night at the Greek Club in South Brisbane. Um, it's, a, mashallah, a very nice venue. And uh, over there will be the second talk, which is Pursuit of Happiness. Um, that will be tomorrow night, and again in Gold Coast on Wednesday, the same talk will be repeated on Wednesday, inshallah. So if you do have any questions, actually, um, please do write them. One of the questions you might want to ask is how many records that were sold <laughs> until now of Loon? Now you would be amazed, really, not 10, not 15, not 100, not 1,000. Really, do ask him how many records were sold, and inshallah, not more rewarding paradise, inshallah. Not because of the records. But, um, so inshallah, if you've got any questions, please write the questions down um, and pass them forward, the sisters, and the brothers, um, you could put the hands up yeah. as Loon requested. And for, um, just for the record, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the non-Muslim brothers and sisters, if you know any questions you want to ask in private, if you don't want to ask them, you know, in front of everybody, I truly understand. You know, I have developed an acute, you know, 
case of shyness myself since I've been a Muslim. But um, inshallah, if you want to ask any questions, feel free whether you do it in this forum or in private. I'll take the time or the initiative to talk to you as my brothers in Islam and my sisters and I mean and from Adam. Stuff from Allah. Alright, so inshallah. that we've got is um, how do you first how did you first know about Islam? Are you planning to attract more more US rappers to Islam? So how did you first know about Islam and are you planning to attract other rap singers to Islam? Bismillah alhamdulillah. Um, like I mentioned earlier I um I, I, I discovered Islam by the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said, I wasn't looking for Islam. I wasn't looking for the Muslim. I wasn't hanging with the Muslim. I had no clue or idea about anything that had anything to do with Islam. I was jahil at the time. Uh, stuff for the law. I used to think that a, a, a Muslim was like an Arab dude on a camel with a hook knife and a gold tooth, like smoking a cigarette or something. So I was completely removed from any understanding of what a movie. You know, I used to watch Woody Woodpecker and stuff like that. Remember, they, I mean, cartoons just show like some weird images of the Muslim. So I was jahil. I didn't know anything about the Muslim. But when I discovered Islam, you know, it's, this, it's the changing of the heart that I believe most reverts can't explain. We can tell you which, where we were standing, which way the wind was blowing, you know, which way the sun was facing. We can give you all the details surrounding what takes place. But to actually explain the changing of the heart, there's really no words that can explain it. Because sometimes if you want to, you know, take this analogy to try to fathom in your mind the understanding, it's like when you have something on the tip of your tongue or you have something that you just know is burning inside of you and you need to suffice it. That's the closest I can get to explaining the understanding. Because what took place with me is I was in Abu Dhabi. After I went from Senegal to Morocco, I mean, I, I've been to Kazakhstan, China, I've been to many countries and I was just shocked that they were all Muslims. I hung out with the president of Kazakhstan. Wallahi, they, they look Chinese, and they was tall, and they, I asked him, how do you say hello in your language? He said, Asalaamu Alaikum. So I'm looking at him like, nah, you're kidding, man. That's the dudes <laughs> in New York that sell the bean pies. They be saying Asalaamu Alaikum to each other. I thought that was, and he's like, nah, Asalaamu Alaikum. So I started to see the diversity of Islam just by traveling. So when I got to Abu Dhabi, something took place in my hotel room with my heart changed. And I ran to the lobby of the hotel, and the first Muslim I found, I just said, you know, I told him straight up, I, I want to be a Muslim. And the brother looked at me like I was crazy. He said, well, what do you mean you want to be a Muslim? I want to be a Muslim, man. So like, you, know, <laughs> you know, like normally we see, you know, we try to advise people about Islam, or we try to call people Islam. I'm running up on this guy, extorting him for my Islam. Like, I need Islam, you know. So he said, you, you serious? I said, I'm serious, man. Because I had something that I knew only the Muslim can explain. Because these things didn't start to happen to me and start until I started to be exposed to certain characteristics and mannerisms of the Muslim and things that go in accordance with Islam. So he told me simply, Muhammad Rasulullah. So I'm standing there looking at him and I thought I'm repeated and I'm like, that's it? You know, not collapse. I said, nah, I'll go shopping now, right? I get one of the outfits. I, I do it. It's more than that. You know, the Arabian Sea right there. Don't you dip me in the water like it's something else? And he was looking at me like, no, 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 collapse. You're Muslim. So I said, subhanAllah, I've never seen that kind of simplicity. Just that alone, you know, just that alone just took me for a ride. I said, I've never seen anything that simple. Money never came that, that simple. Business deal, nothing, nothing really just came that simple, you know. So that's just a brief, you know, uh, uh, example of what took place when 
the hearts change. Even some of your brothers that made Umar and Hajj, you can't explain it. You know, you've been aiming your body towards the Kaaba for years. You finally get there. You're standing in front of the very place that you've been directing your Salat. If you can't explain that, then I'll probably be questionable to me. I'll be like, you can actually explain that in detail? SubhanAllah, I couldn't. It took for me to be shaving my head, and I just started bawling. Because I was just in a state of suspense the whole time I made Umrah until that clipper went across my head and shaved my hair and I'm watching my hair roll down. And I'm like, I really did it. You know? So, alhamdulillah, that's how I found Islam, inshallah. Okay, no problem. Alhamdulillah, the Muslims now, instead of just golden teeth, we all wear braces just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Still metal. Okay. What's your secret to firmly walking away from all the dunya you've had? There's really no secret. It's called obedience. You know, I spent most of my life not wanting to listen to nobody. I hated police. I hated listening. To, I was hard-headed. I don't want to listen to nobody. And that's why I found myself incarcerated, found myself hurt, hurting people, things of that nature, because I never wanted to listen. So to know that I have an opportunity at this age to now be obedient and receive the reward for being obedient, this is how, you know, I stay firm. And plus, I keep myself around people that feel love. Keep myself around people that love Allah. Because y'all all do this around test time, all of y'all in university. Y'all go get the square kid and hang out with him when it's time to do tests. You don't say nothing to him through the whole school year. Sisters, you too. You don't say nothing to her through the whole school year. As soon as it's test time, she get to come to your house and have tea and meet your family and a brother to her. Come to my house. You know, hey, father, have a shot. Oh, here, it's my dad. It's a huh, huh. So, yo, you were studying science, right? Like, you know, you try to game them for. <laughs> you cheating too, yo. <laughs> and, here, and here, what? What grade he in? You already know. SubhanAllah. But yeah, this is, you know, this is how you stay firm. Like I said, you know, it's incumbent upon us to aid one another. And your company and your companions is a reflection of your deen. So when you're around people who are firm, you're not going to speak certain ways. When you're around people that are shy, you're not going to do certain things. Because you know they're going to salam you and they're going to skate off on you because they're shy. They're going to go, it's not like, I just can't do this type of stuff we're doing. You know what I'm saying? And two things won't even happen. It's either going to rub off for you or you're not going to hang with them no more. So just try to surround yourself by people who have taqwa, people who feel love, people that love Allah, people that know Allah is listening and watching. Some of us really think that, you know, it's like some blind spots out there that you could just stand and like the camera don't see you or something. You know, there's no blind spots. Allah sees everything. Allah hears everything. So any individual that you hang with that's, that knows that, this would be a suitable companion for you. And Allah knows best. <coughs> yes. Uh, the next question says, do you ever miss your old lifestyle? To be honest with you, only because I know what comes with it, no. You know, if I didn't accomplish as much as I did in that lifestyle, I think that, you know, the human aspect of myself would struggle with it. But being that I know what comes with it, I don't miss it. Because you can't have, like they say, a cake and eat it too. You can't have a piece of it without taking the whole thing. So by me knowing in, t in totality, you know, what this entails, what this lifestyle entails, this is not for me. This is not for me, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and once you find a cure, you know, you don't return to the place that made you sick. It's just not logical. It just doesn't make any sense. You were sitting there coughing your lungs out. You know, every time you cough, there's blood in your hand. You go see a doctor and he gives you something that's very limited. It's not a lot of this going around. But you take this medicine and you cure yourself. Do you go out there and take the risk of getting sick again and knowing that this medicine may not be available the next time? No, doesn't make any sense. So no, I don't miss the lifestyle because I know what it comes with it. But the only thing I do, you know, 
to reflect on those, those things is I made dua for these brothers because I know what they're going through. They smile when the camera's on. But when that camera's off, these people are, are dying inside. You understand? They're dying inside. Because it's like, once again, that roller coaster. Once you buckle up and that joint is going up that long, steep hill, you can't get off. You have to ride it out. And that's the mentality of these individuals. They know they have to ride it out. I can't jump off right now, you know? But by Allah's mercy, I was able to get off. Soon as they loosen up the buckles, and I'll never, by Allah's permission, inshallah to Allah, may Allah keep us all firm. I'll never return to that, inshallah. <clears throat> Had this question says, what's the ultimate thing that made you accept Islam? What's the ultimate thing? What's the real, the, the main thing that made you accept Islam? And, 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 and what can you say to non-Muslims to invite them to Islam? The ultimate thing is, once again, simplicity. As children, like the brother here, his son, alhamdulillah, mashallah, handsome brother, you know, if something happens to you as a child, you fall, bump your head, your head is bleeding. You'll run past seven people that can help you just to get to your mama. Remember those days? Head bleeding. One guy got gauze, the other guy got peroxide. You run straight past them because all you want is homie. I just want my homie. He's like, I can help you. Chill. Get off me. I just want my homie. But as adults, we need that one source that we could run to. We need the one source that we could run to. And this is Allah as a wajal. And monotheism is the foundation of his religion. Monotheism, monotheism was the religion of Moses. Monotheism was the religion of Jesus. Monotheism was the religion of Noah. They worship one God and one God alone. And this is the wisdom behind Allah's religion is because he's perfect in it. This would never change due to a man. This would never change, you know, you know due to anything. Only Allah's decree. And if he decree us to worship him and him alone, this does not change because of anyone, any individual. You understand? So I guess my advice to the non-Muslims is to search. Because even in Christianity, I'll give you some pointers. You know, monotheism is established. It's established in the Bible. This is what made me reject it when I tell you and I was in my Bible studies. First commandment, thou shalt not place no other God before me. First pillar of Islam, lay in the hail of law. That's Tawheed. There's also a verse in Isaiah that sounds very similar to Surah Eclat. In Isaiah, which is before Jesus came, is in the Torah, he says, you may know me and know that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. For I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. SubhanAllah. Any Muslim here knows Surah so class? Say, He is Allah. He is the one, right? He's the self sufficient. He wasn't begotten, nor did, you know, he, nor did he begotten any. You know, and there's nothing, co -compar no, nothing comparable. There's nothing comparable to him. So, Tawheed is established in all religions. In all religions. Allah created his religion to be monotheist. And the Quran is only an affirmation of this. The Quran speaks about the Torah that came with Moses, Musa alayhi salam. But Islam is the only religion that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this nation today, we were sent the warner. We were sent the messenger. During the time of Isa alayhi salam, he was the warner for that nation. During the time of Musa alayhi salam, he was the warner for that nation. So we've been sent the warner for this nation today. And it's the Prophet Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, what's more ultimate than that? Barakallahu <coughs> feekum. The next question says, what do you feel when you watch your old videos? 
can you still move like that? Astaghfirullah. <laughs> 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 yeah, he threw some, he threw some grease on that. Now, alhamdulillah, I mean, when I look at these videos, like I said, it increases me in gratitude. You know, it reminds me of how lost I was, and it reminds me of how merciful Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is. When I look at this stuff, wallahi, it tickles me now. You know, it really tickles me because it's like, man, you almost went out like that, man. You almost went out like that. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the sharaf that would have took place? SubhanAllah. If, if Loon would have died like that? He probably would have buried me with a jumpsuit on and a cross on my neck and had a bunch of people, you know. Stuff a lot of things, monkey. Wash and shroud me, man. And, you know, come on, SubhanAllah. But when I look at this stuff, like I said, it only makes me reflect on the mercy that's been bestowed upon me. And any time any of us come you know, in, into, into the grips with any reminder that reminds you of the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not ignore it. Reflect on it, ponder on it, and remind yourself of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when I look at this stuff, that's all it does for me. Like that guy was gone. He was out of here. SubhanAllah, when I look at some of this stuff, I actually know that I might have been intoxicated at the time. Well, like, you know, so hopefully that benefits you, inshallah. Okay, Jazakallah. Hey, the next question says, young, young Muslims who acknowledge their identity as Muslims, in light of the negative image of Islam at the moment in the media, how can young Muslims stand up and be proud of their identity. The identity of the Muslim is the identity of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The identity of the, Mus the Muslim is the identity of the mother of believers. This is your identity. All you have to do is implement what they came with. That's how you stand up. There's no physical rebellious act that needs to take place. You understand? For us as Muslims to dominate so much of the world's population, and when you start breaking the ratio down from 1.5 billion to how many practice, maybe 100 million to how many on the Sunday, how many, if you break it down, you'll see what the problem is. It's self-inflicted. As the Prophet said, the Muslim will continue to be humiliated until we return to our religion. So that's how you stand up. Return to your religion. Some of y'all, y'all seen the movie Rocky? When he got a big fight, what'd he do? He go back to punching meat in the freezer, chasing chickens. He don't get in no high-tech gym. You know what I'm saying? It counts your cardio and all that, and counts your you know, heart rate and all these like plugs up stuff. Like he goes back to the basics. So subhanAllah, even if a, you know, a, a Italian boxer knows to go back to the basics, who are we you know, to neglect the fact that we have to go back to the source? We have to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. We have to go back to the example of the Sahaba. And there's nothing wrong with it at all. There's nothing wrong, you know. And as far as the media, subhanAllah, turn the TV on. Straight up, just turn the TV on. Leave it alone. Because as the African American in America, I totally understand what media propaganda and all that entails. You understand? I understand exactly what it entails. And it's only a fear tactic. It only makes you fear being what you are. You're Muslim. Now all of a sudden, as long as Muslims have been here, we the topic of bad media, bad slander, because two or three idiots chose to go out there and do something stupid. Now all of us are bad. Come on. This is not hard to put together in your minds. You know yourself. You know your obligation to Allah. You know you haven't contributed to anything that brings, brings forth this kind of slander. So stick to, you know, hold on to the rope of Allah. Stay firm upon your religion. 
Practice your religion. Read the Kitab of Allah. Study the Son of the Prophet Use your time because you're going to be questioned about it. And this, this is a repetitive thing. We're going to always end up going back here. Sad to say, I'm going to try to give you the best answers from experiences, but eventually the conclusion of the answer is always going to go back to what? The Quran and the Sunnah. You got the test and you got the answers. How could you fail? It's wrong. <coughs> okay. Um, the minute I, I heard that moon is coming down to Australia, this was the question I was afraid of all along. It says, are you married? <laughs> if so, if so, do you have any children? And something related to family, who of your family members became Muslim and was your daughter part of those who embraced Islam? See, normally this is the paper that ends up on the side of the panel. This is the one that I act like I didn't see. No, I've been married for 15 years, you know. Alhamdulillah, you know, me and my wife have been together for 15 years. She's been through every struggle with me from Loon, the guy in the street. Because I've been Loon since I was 13. That name ain't come with the record. Like, I was Loon. I was Looney. Maj Noon for some of y'all, you know. <laughs> I wasn't rap right. I didn't have an intimidating voice or an intimidating presence, so I had to go the extra mile to get people's attention, if you know what I mean. But she stuck through a lot of things with me, and when I accepted Islam, she accepted Islam maybe two months after me. And yes, I do have children, you know. I've had two children prior to my relationship with my wife. One is B-19. Next month, she's in her second year of college. I have another daughter that be 17 at the top of the year. She's in high school. And my son, he's 14. I have a seven-year-old daughter, and I just had a newborn daughter, my firstborn Muslim. Her name is Nasiha. And alhamdulillah. Now, as far as family members, yes, my grandfather, he's 88 years old. He accepted Islam. You know, my son, he accepted Islam. My wife accepted Islam. I have many friends who are not televised who accepted Islam and by Allah's decree many of these talks that I've given many uh, you know non-Muslims have approached me with curiosity about Islam and you know by you know Allah's permission they've accepted Islam so many to be honest with you I never give these talks with the intention of you know getting shahadas you understand because as Muslims, we know this, and I'm going to share this with the non-Muslims as well. We don't make Muslims. You understand? Allah makes Muslims. We're not evangelists. You understand? We're not, people, we're not missionaries. We don't do these type of things. All we do to avoid it being a hujjah against us on Yom Kiyam is we stand in the presence of a non-Muslim. It is obligatory for us to call you to Islam. It's obligatory for us to introduce you to Islam. But like I told you before, in my neighborhood with all the Muslims that was there, not name one of them, you know, called us to Islam. There's been times, you know, you'd be short on pamper money. You go to the, you know, the Yemeni store, you would think right there, I'm vulnerable. I need to, you know, I need to, you know, let me go for at least a dollar or two on these pampers. This would be a moment for you right now. But, you know, no one ever sees these moments. No one ever called us to Islam. And may Allah forgive those brothers. But, you know, every time someone accepts Islam, I tell you no lie, I have to go sometimes and just go gather myself because it's just a reminder to me that whatever's taking place in that person's heart, I know what it feel like. I know what it feel like. When a person gets over, you know, the curiosity and the suspicions, or the whispers from the shaitan. Or sometimes when you're standing there watching this person debating, you're hearing, you know, you're seeing Allah guiding them, you're seeing the shaitan, it's almost like a bidding war going on right in their minds and their heart is changing right in front of you. And only by Allah's permission that war is won and that person turns around and accepts Islam. And all you can do at that point is know that this is the best person in the room right now. 
for the person that accepts Islam, Allah forgives you for all of your past deeds and turn all of those bad deeds into good deeds. So can you imagine my grandfather, 88 years old? I ain't even gonna get into this stuff. <laughs> SubhanAllah, he's a good man. You know, he served the army for 30 years. He was the first black captain. And he did a lot of things, you know. He's a war hero. But none of it was for the sake of Allah. So at 88, do you understand the type of slate that Allah just cleaned for this man? I had, to, I had to walk out the room and get myself together to come back to continue, like, you know, giving them down. So, you know, this is a beautiful thing when anybody accepts Islam. I don't really target the pub daddies and the 50 cents and all these people. You know, inshallah, I make dua for them because the Muslim has more rights over me than them. So I'd be more concerned about y'all. You know, what's going on in your head? What's going on in your life, man? Can I aid my brother? Are you okay? You need anything? I'm in love. And I will hope that you will do the same for me. So this is the beauty of our religion, inshallah. And may Allah guide all of our loved ones for the reverbs out there that's not Muslim. May they guide all of our family into the fold of Islam, inshallah. Uh, this question says, have the actions of Muslims, example terrorism in the media, have they made you question your religion? Uh, not at all. Because terrorism is not from Islam. Terrorism is not permissible. Terrorism is not practiced in Islam. Terrorism comes from weak individuals who have no patience. For the Lord commands us to be patient. If you think about the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions, before they were commanded the war, how patient they were. Times when the Prophet Sallallahu would be in Saju. And people, you know, people from the Quraysh would throw, you know, camel, you know, subhanAllah with those feces and stuff on his head while he's prostrating to Allah's plan to Allah. And when you think of these things, many of us would just jump up, throwing punches. Some of us would just run to the car, pop the trunk. We, we would go crazy. You throw doodle on me while I'm praying to my Lord? But the patience, the virtue of the Prophet of some of his companions, it just reminds you of how we need to be the same way. We need to be patient. We need to practice our religion. Because I haven't been to a secular country or a non-Muslim country yet that says you can't pray. I've never been to a country yet that says this is one of the laws, their constitutional law, that you can't pray here. No one says that in Australia. There's no law, there's nothing legislated that says you can't pray. You can't be a Muslim here. So if no one is, you know, being oppressed, if no one is stopping you from worshiping Allah, then why do we busy ourselves worrying about, you know, acting out of emotion and not acting out of, you know, looking for the pleasure of Allah? Many of you know the Hadith of Ali, radiallahu an, when he was on the battlefield. And a man, you know, he struck a man and he fell and Ali was standing over him ready to butcher him alive. And the man spit in his face. And what did Ali do? He spared his life. Why? Because at that very moment, he wasn't going to kill him for the sake of Allah. By him spitting it in his face, it changed his whole intention. He was going to do it out of anger. He was going to do it out of frustration. But he stopped himself. Because at that time, when that war was a commandment for the Sahaba to carry out, he couldn't carry out that particular moment because it wasn't for the sake of Allah. So we have to be patient, first and foremost, with ourselves. Then we have to be patient with others. And we, need, and we definitely don't need to busy ourselves with these individuals who cannot control themselves and allow their emotions to steer the car. You understand? So may Allah free us from this and make us from those you know, who he is pleased with, inshallah. Um, th this one is about social life. It says, how do you balance social life keeping in mind the teachings of Islam? So maybe they're talking about, I guess, uh, the social life that other people are used to. How would you manage your social life keeping the teachings in Islam? Okay. This question is really based on how you determine social life. 
because I don't know if you look at social life as in comparison to how the non-Muslims socialize. And this is where we kind of go astray. This is where I kind of see things, you know, where we're removing ourselves from the teachings of Islam. You may see individuals have a certain type of social gathering or social platform for socializing. So now we need to have an Islamic one. You know what? They have UFC. Why don't we have MFC? Muslim Federation Corporate. You know what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say is like, this is where the discord comes from the obedience of the Muslim and staying steadfast upon our deen is when we start to try to duplicate the social lives of those who are not Muslims. And may Allah guide them. Because these social things, if you ever looked at these MTV shows, busted. <laughs> you know, you look at these MTV shows, right? Real world and all this type of stuff. They put five strangers in the room. Five strangers in the room. And it's balanced out between, you know, men and women. You have the one girl, she's so high, so diddy, I don't do all that, I don't do all that, I don't do all that. By the end of the show, everyone didn't have physical relations with each other. It's just ridiculous. This is what social environments do. They breed fitna, they breed sin. What is a social in environment for the Muslim? Sitting in a circle, together with your brothers and sisters, reading the Quran. Sitting in a circle, reflecting on, you know what I'm saying? The times of the Prophet started selling and the companions. This is a healthy social environment. Who says we can't do it over a hot plate of food? There's nothing wrong with that. Who say that we can't be in a park somewhere or somewhere where, you know, we have open space to just let our hair down, for lack of better words. This is healthy for us. But stuff for the law then when cats is at the I mean, I live in Egypt. And you know, after a certain hour, I mean they everybody, I mean, gets crazy. You can go eat in a day when you know most of the practicing Muslim is out. Restaurants that have TV, they'll play soccer, certain things. SubhanAllah, after Maghrib, but Wallahi Aki, they have just the Arab singing girl up there. She's like the Arabian Beyonce that's breaking out, you know, the shisha pots. And these cats are just looking like Jamaicans. I'm like, what's wrong with them? As they say, everybody's smoking. They just puffing. I'm like, yo, what is that? You understand? This is not a healthy social environment. And it saddens me sometimes when I see the modest sister sitting amongst these people and it's like, man, give it a week, man. Next thing will come out of the hair, next thing is going to be pulled back and look like a hoodie, and next thing you know it's just going to be off. And she's just going to be sitting there with them too. Going, <laughs> Same thing with the brothers. You can tell he's shy. He's trying to hit, wave and cough and eat at the same time. Next thing you know it's like, let me hit that. So, you know. Just stay firm upon you know what's correct and stay out of the environments that's a fitness to you. You know what I'm saying? Allah knows best. Okay, we'll just take two more questions, inshallah. There's this question, there's a very beautiful question. I'll leave it for the last one. Um, and this question says, What advice can you give to the brothers who are new to Islam? And we have had some people very recently becoming I'm Muslims. Yeah, you're telling me. My advice to the brothers that's new in Islam, and alhamdulillah, I want to thank all y'all for being patient because I don't have nowhere to go. So I can run my mouth till they kick me out. I have no place else to go. It ain't like I can just leave. They got me. But my advice to the new brothers or sisters as well who accepted Islam is to learn the religion the way it was established. Learn the religion the way it was established. Tawheed was the call of all the prophets to single out Allah and all acts of worship. Learn to heed. Because in order to truly learn or love Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to understand to heed. So learn the religion the way it was conveyed. Before revelations and everything came down, before the Quran was compiled, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi called the people to la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. He did this for many years, many, many years. The Prophet Noah, alayhi salam, he did this for 950 years. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. So understanding the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the perfect foundation to understanding your religion. 
Because I know sometimes, you know, you go to all the heart softening books, but you miss the real juices. The real juices is understanding Tawheed. These two books should never, ever collect dust in your house. It's the Quran and the Kitab of Tawheed. This is something you can always reflect on. And Talat al Usul, three fundamental principles of Islam. Understanding the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. It's deeper than just Shadow La ilaha illallah and your sin and brother on their way. Understand the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. You know, and this will build your foundation because you understand when you build the house, you don't build it from the roof, you build it from the ground. So build your deen from the beginning. Build your deen from the floor. And inshallah, Allah increases us. Especially when you do this sincerely. So my advice to the new brothers and sisters in Islam, learn the deen the way it was conveyed. Learn to he first, then study the book of Allah. And you'll understand, subhanAllah, the difference when you read the Quran and understand to he. Even when you know Tawheed, you can identify with shirk from like a thousand miles away. You understand? So my advice to you, alhamdulillah, learn the religion the way it's conveyed. You can go deep into the books and miss the juice. That's really important. Not to forget the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our real relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a last question, a beautiful question. There are a lot of other questions here, many other questions here. And some of them are very, very important questions. Actually, they all are, but some of them are related to the talk tonight, tomorrow night, which is pursuit of happiness. So I'll leave them. We'll keep these questions and go through them tomorrow after the talk tomorrow night, which you can see up on the screen. Now, just for the last question, how was, and this, a lot of people speak about it, that it was such a special moment for them. It says, how was your first sujood? How was your first time you prostrated to Allah? And, ha and your first fast, how did it feel? Uh, wow, that is a good question. Wow, may Allah reward you whoever asks this question. Somebody that's going to be a doctor by this handwriting right here. <laughs> now, alhamdulillah, um, I remember the first time I prayed. <clears throat> and it's funny because I was very shy about getting it wrong. So when I was advised that whatever I knew was sufficient. So I remember the first time, all I knew was Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah, Akbar. That was it. So when I finished the prayer, I remember walking from the room I used to pray in my house and walk into my, my bedroom. And I remember grabbing the remote control and turning the TV on. Then I just started crying refusely. I couldn't, I didn't even like, I, it was one of those, I didn't even see it coming. I didn't feel no tears coming. I didn't even feel, it was just like, something just overwhelmed me. And that's when I knew at that moment that, you know, I had actually, you know, spoke to Allah, I actually prayed, like for real, you know? Not the, oh my God, help me when you shot, you know? Not the, oh my God, you know, I'll never drink again if you just get me through this one. I did these things. This was a real salat, this was a real prayer, and I felt the connection with Allah even when I couldn't identify with it right away. But I cried. And ever since then, I took this a lot, extremely serious. So I guess, leaving on this note, I want to leave this as a message to all my brothers and sisters in Islam. This a lot is serious. It is serious. This is purification. And there's no rush. Take your time and pray. You understand? Take your time and pray. When I see people rushing through this a lot, subhanAllah, it bothers me. Because it's like, what if this is your last a lot? What if it's the last one? Sometimes people go into real court and it's like, did you even recite Surah Fatih? Like, what, what did this, what did you just say? 
take your time and pray. Make sure in every you know, position that you allow your body to rest in that position before you go into the next position. From the top there, take your time. Say the dua before you start to pray. When you go into the court, straighten out your back. Take your time. When you come out of the court, back into the top of here. Take your time. And you know when you enter when you enter Jew, this is the closest you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is when we postrate our heads to the floor. We're at the closest point. We're closer to Allah there. Take your time. So, you know, pray your prayers. And pray them like they're your last. And a good way to keep your cool sure is think about death. Think about death when you're praying. That will definitely keep you in, 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 you know, keep your cool sure strong when you know that death is right around the corner. Think about death. This could be my last prayer, my last salah. And y'all have seen some of the YouTubes. I know y'all have. And y'all seen a man in Medina who died as a Jew. SubhanAllah. Wow. His last salah took place in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he died as a Jew. It's another one on YouTube where man is praying alone. Y'all seen that one too. Brothers was walking in and out of the masjid and they didn't even check the brother. He was in a Jew. Return to Allah. So on this note, as far as waking up, please take this a lot serious. Please wake up for Fajr. Pray your Fajr on time. Pray all your Salat on time. Because if you don't have a legitimate excuse for prolonging your Salat, this is not acceptable. They have a saying, pray before you pray on. Jazakum khayr and salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair to the Amir to the room. Um, many of us we might think standing in front of 30,000 people to 50,000 people and them loving you, that might be the ultimate happiness, having a fanfare and everything. But then from there to Islam, the pursuit of happiness, the life as a rap star and now the life as a Muslim, that pursuit of happiness, that's the topic of our talk tomorrow night. And we hope you will join us tomorrow and we'll do the rest of the questions tomorrow as well.